Thank you for joining me for worship today. Today is the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. Our order of service is in the bulletin. We're going to begin right now with hymn number 517 from the Red Book. It's 583 in the Blue Book, slightly different version in each book, but we'll use it from the Red Book today. Almighty Father, strong to save. Almighty Father, strong to save, whose arm has bound the restless wave, who bids the mighty ocean deep its own appointed limits keep. O oh, hear our earnest humble plea for those in peril on the sea. O Christ, the Lord of hill and plain, o'er which our traffic runs amain, by mountain pass or valley low, wherever, Lord, your people go, protect them by your guarding can from every peril on the land. O Spirit, whom the Father sent to spread abroad the firmament, O wind of heaven, by your might, save all who dare the eagle's flight, and keep them by your watchful care from every peril in the air. O Trinity of love and power, your people shield in danger's hour, from rock and tempest, fire and foe, protect them all where'er they go, thus evermore to you shall be glad praise from air and land and sea. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me, according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins by the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are they who take refuge in him. Your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues forever. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are they who take refuge in Him. Our Old Testament reading for this fifth Sunday after Pentecost is from Job chapter 38 verses 1 to 11. In this section, Job, God is reminding Job and us that God is God and, well, it really is important that we 
Don't try to step in and take his place. Let God be God. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set, or who, hit, who laid its cornerstone, while the morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted for joy? Who shut up the sea behind doors, when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment, and wrapped it in thick darkness? When I fixed limits for it, and set its doors and bars in place? When I said, this far you may come and no further. Here is where your proud waves halt. Just a reading that reminds us that God's wisdom and his strength is so far above us, we'll want to, well, let God be God, trust in him. Alleluia. Because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. These words are written that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Our gospel reading is from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. Occasion in which Jesus showed his power over nature by calming a storm. That day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Let's sing our next hymn. It's in our bulletin. I have it listed as hymn number 961, Oh, How I Love Jesus. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells me what my Father hath in store for every day, and though I tread a darksome path, yield sunshine all the way. Oh, how I love Jesus, 
Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving art can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. The grace and love of our Lord and Savior be with us always. Amen. The word of God we want to consider today is our epistle reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 to 21, where the Apostle Paul was inspired to write, For Christ's love compels us, but because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let's bow our heads for prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, who art our strength and our salvation. Amen. My dear friends who are loved by God. There are many different forces or influences in this world that motivate us, that compel us to do the things that we do. For example, one person may have this love for power and that makes him work as hard as he possibly can so that he can be the boss of his company uh, of the place where he works. Or maybe a person might have a love for money, and that love for money motivates him to do everything that he does. Or another thing, a person might just have a love of fame. Having his name mean something to people, and because of that, he ends up working like crazy doing what he does. Or maybe a person is motivated by this strong desire to do absolutely everything that he can, give everything that he can to his family so that, oh, for example, his children can have things that he didn't have when he was a child. All of these things are strong forces that push people. And, well, maybe a person is just a workaholic and that desire, that love to work, is what motivates the person and pushes him along. Well, everybody has forces that motivate them, and in our reading, the Apostle Paul tells us about what it was that actually motivated him that moved him, and what motivated him, what moved him was Christ's love. And really, when you think about it, Christ's love is what will motivate anyone who's a believing child of God. 
It should be what motivates us to live our lives as God's believing children, to, to strive to do God's will, and to be Christ's witnesses in the world. That really should be the motivating factor in every Christian's life. So we'll want to join the Apostle Paul in our reading for today when he says, Christ's love compels us. And as we consider that motivating factor in our lives, we'll see what Christ did for us and then what we become through Christ. In this section, it almost appears as if Paul had been asked by someone or some group of people why he was so crazy, so foolish to preach about Jesus. Because his preaching about Jesus didn't bring any personal rewards or personal benefits for him in this life. Paul didn't benefit from it. Actually, if you think about it, he, he never got rich. And whenever he would go to different places, it seems like so often the different cities that he preached to, the people in those cities ended up going after him and attacking him, trying to kill him, trying to stone him to death, having him imprisoned. Well, it really does seem as if he was crazy or foolish for preaching the gospel. But Paul said that he knew what it meant to be a believer in Jesus as the Savior. And being a believer in Jesus the Savior meant that Christ's love compelled him. He knew that all he knew all that Jesus in his grace and mercy and love had done for him and, and for the world. So Paul said we are convinced that we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. Christ died for all. He paid for the sins of the entire world. And that was something that Paul just absolutely couldn't keep to himself. He had to share that message. And I would say that it was more difficult for Paul to keep that message to himself than it would be for, for CNN or Fox News to keep it a secret if the war in Ukraine or all the fighting in the Mideast Mid ended up ceasing totally. Those news agencies, they couldn't keep that a secret. Well, it was even more difficult for Paul to keep the message about Jesus, the Savior, a secret. He had a special message to share. Jesus died for all. His de death paid for, for everyone. His death paid for both of the criminals who were crucified with Jesus there at Mount Calvary. And remember the one, well, by the grace of God, the one started out mocking Jesus, but ended up being made a believing child of God and was assured by Jesus that he go to heaven and the other thief he rejected what Jesus did because Jesus died from now on all of us who believe in him have also died to sin and the slavery to sin sin can no longer really hold us it can't drive us down because God made us believers. He made us part of his believing family. We, we can say we have died to and been freed from the effects of sin. Well, Paul said, and Jesus died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. In some parts of the world it used to be the case and in other parts of the world it still is the case. If someone rescued you or saved you from death, if someone's life is saved by someone else, 
then that one whose life was saved ends up becoming a slave to the person who rescued him. And now it really kind of makes sense because if you think about it, that person who rescued him saved his life. He, the person who was rescued, he would have had no life if it weren't for his rescuer. He owes his life entirely to the one who saved his life. And now that's, of course, our situation with Jesus as well, but to a greater extent because Jesus didn't just save our bodies, our physical lives, he saved our souls. Without him, we'd be doomed. We'd be lost forever. But with Jesus, we're saved. We have that assurance of heaven as our eternal home. And now what we can do is we can think of ourselves as being his slaves. We, we owe our life to him. We'll want to live for him. We'll want to be his children. And now when we think of ourselves as slaves totally indebted to him, well, we're his slaves, but we're also his children. We're also his heirs. And it's a wonderful, it's a special place to be. But now, Paul is saying here that we should no longer live for ourselves, just thinking about me, myself, and I. We'll want to live for Jesus, the one who lived and died and rose from the dead to assure us of, of his victory and, and our victory over Satan and sin as well. Since we are his slaves and also his children and, and his heirs, as I said, how would we describe ourselves as his part-time slaves, servants, sons, daughters, heirs, part-time slaves who, who just would show up once in a while to serve him and to to praise him and to, to bless his name, coming to worship and not having Christ in the regular part of our lives? Or are we full-time slaves and children and heirs of God who are doing all in our lives to the glory of God, doing all in our lives to serve our Savior? And well, surely we'd want to think of ourselves as full-time slaves, sons and daughters, and heirs of our Savior. Since he did everything for us, we'll want to, well, whatever we do, do it all to the glory of God. And what we can also do now is because we've been saved by Christ, because of everything that he's done for us, what we can do is we can look at the rest of the people in the world and, and not just simply think of them as other rats in the rat race of this world, and not just think of them as people that we're to judge socially or economically or politically, but rather what we want to do is look at the other people around us and see everyone as a person with an eternal soul who needs to know about Jesus, who needs to know about this amazing Savior that we have who's done such amazing things for us and whose love for us is just so great and such a motivating fact in our lives. Paul said, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this, day, in this way, we do so no longer. Before the Holy Spirit called Paul to the faith, what happened is that when Paul looked at Jesus, he really looked at Jesus and saw him as basically a, a, a normal human being being, a normal human being, another human being, someone he thought, Paul thought, was fighting against the one true God, but 
then what happened is that Paul was called to faith. He was made a believing child of God so that he knew that Jesus was his Savior who was serving the one true God. And, and really that same change that took place in Paul, that also took place in us as well. Before we were called to faith, we couldn't see Jesus for who he was. But now by the grace of God, we can see him as our Savior and our way to eternal life. And his love is what compels us and motivates us to live as the believing children of God that we are. Well, seeing Jesus spiritually, seeing him as our Savior means that our greatest fears have been taken care of for us. We don't have to fear death, sin, or the devil anymore. As a matter of fact, what we can do is look at our Savior and see him as the, the conqueror of death and Satan and sin, those enemies. And anyone who isn't able to see Jesus spiritually like we, by the grace of God, can. He has to be afraid of what's going to end up happening in his life. Every night when he goes to bed, he really has to worry about what will happen if he doesn't wake up. As believers, though, what we can do is we can go to bed and we can simply pray. Oh, think of that wonderful, simple, childlike child prayer that perhaps many of us grew up using, perhaps still use today, that prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray thee, Lord, my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And know that he will take us to heaven someday. And what a beautiful, confident prayer in faith, just saying, Lord, you take care of me, whether that's in this life or whether it's in the life to come in heaven. You take care of me and I'm going to trust in you to take care of me. Well, Jesus takes care of our fears. We're no longer slaves of sin. So what do we become? Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God. As a new creation, we're spiritually alive. We're able to serve God. When the Holy Spirit calls us to faith and makes us believing children of God, he, he gives us a fresh start. We're born again is the phrase that's used in scripture. And what God does is he forgets about our life of sin when we were his enemies, when we deserved God's wrath and punishment. You know, we've all heard that proverb which says, encourages us to forgive and forget. And that's not something that's always easy for us to do. We may forgive someone who hurts or harms us, but it's often very difficult for us to forget about the hurt. Yet God does forgive and forget because Jesus paid for our sins. The Father sees us as his believing sinless children. He doesn't see the sin that's there in us as believing children of God. Uh, our sins, however, they're not just forgotten by our God, they're gone forever because the blood of Jesus washes them away forever. Now, we forgiven children of God, God gives to us the, he calls it the ministry of reconciliation, that we are to proclaim to others what God has done for us and, and for them as well. Sometimes I wonder, sometimes I wonder if, we may not realize how much God really has done for us. 
how big a hole our sins have put us in and how God gets us out of that. We say that God takes care of our sins, but, but, but what does that really mean? Maybe we can get a picture of what God did for us when we just think about a, the United States national debt and that national debt, I don't know how many trillions of dollars that is or if it's past the trillions of dollars amount. None of us could ever think about paying that and, and all of us as a group and well, everyone in the world if all of us took together all of our, well, that's a debt we can't think about paying. All of us together couldn't pay that debt. And if we pay the God to God the amount that our nation is indebted, we still wouldn't actually pay for a single one of our sins. That's a very sobering, sobering thought. But Jesus' death on the cross paid for the sins of everyone. Absolutely everyone who has or will walk this earth. There's no dollar amount that could pay for our sins. It's the blood of Christ that pays for sin. And his death did pay for my sins, all my sins, all your sins, and all the sins of the world. And now just think how valuable and how precious that makes the life of our Savior. And he gave that amazingly valuable and precious life to pay for my sins and your sins and the sins of the world. Now you and I have the privilege of proclaiming that message. God wants us to be his ambassadors into the world with the gospel. In our nation, that position of ambassador is very much an honorary position. There, there's of course work involved with it, of course. Ambassadors are appointed by the president and those who get the job of being an ambassador are often very close to the president and maybe they were strong supporters of the president and so he honors them by, by making them ambassadors. God also honors us by making us his ambassadors. He, he doesn't give us that special position because of anything we have done. He simply gives us that position of being his ambassadors, his witnesses, because of his grace and mercy. And it really doesn't make sense, much sense for God to make us his ambassadors. Would, would we expect the president right now to make an ambassador of someone he considers his enemy, someone like President Putin of, of Russia or former President Donald Trump, that just wouldn't happen. And likewise, we'd say it really shouldn't happen that God makes us his ambassadors. Our sin, our rebellion against God hardly makes us worthy of being his ambassadors, but he gives us that wonderful privilege he gives us that wonderful privilege. God does forgive, forget our sins. They're gone because of the blood of Christ, not just forgotten. And now he gives us that wonderful privilege of being his witnesses. Paul said, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, with that verse, understand he isn't saying you do this, you do something so that you are reconciled to God. That it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. We're to be reconciled by God to God. God has to do the work. 
Only through Jesus can God reconcile us to himself. And that was done, as Paul says, when God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus was without sin. He kept God's law perfectly for us, yet God made him carry all of our sins to the cross. And our Savior, who became also true God, he was able to carry all of our sins and the sins of the whole world to the cross. And because he did carry all of those sins and did pay for all of those sins, therefore now we have the righteousness or the sinlessness of God. And since God has so blessed us that we who deserve God's wrath and punishment now have the righteousness, the sinlessness, the holiness of God, it really does make sense for us to want to be Christ's messengers, ministers of that reconciliation that Christ has won for us so that more and more people can receive the forgiveness of sins and the eternal life that we know is ours. When God called Moses to be the leader of the children of Israel, we can remember how well, reluctant he was, and reluctant there really is a mild word, word. He didn't want to do it. He came up with all kinds of excuses. He said that basically he was a nobody, that nobody would listen to him. He said that the people wouldn't believe him when he said he was sent by God to, to lead them out of Egypt. He said that he wasn't a good speaker and and he point blank said to God, I don't want to do it, get somebody else, basically. God's solution to those problems should have been clear when God said to Moses, I will be with you. And think about what God was able to do through Moses. If we have fears about being God's ambassadors, let's remember that God promises us that he'll be with us always. And in his word, he gives us all the words that we need to share with those who might have questions about the hope and the faith that we have in our Savior. He gives us all the words that we need to say God doesn't send out his workers and then forget about them. He's always with them, working through his word, working through you and me so that his church keeps on growing, so more souls are added to God's believing family. Oh, love for power, money, fame, other forces can be great motivators in a person's life, but Christ's love is an even greater motivator, a stronger motivator, well, especially for us who by the grace of God believe in Jesus. Especially when we consider everything that our Savior has done for us and what he's done for us who deserved his wrath and punishment. It's no, it's so amazing. So doesn't Christ's love compel us and motivate us to make known what our Savior has done for us with his life and his death and his resurrection when he paid for my sins and your sins and the sins of the whole world. What our God has done for us it's, it's truly amazing. And to say that he loves us sounds like such an understatement. 
He really loves us. What he's done for us, it motivates us to say, it motivates us to say, well, what he's done for us, wouldn't I rather die than lose what he's done for me? Because what he's done for me is so great. What he's done for you is so great. Christ's love, it compels us now. It motivates us now. Paul said he died for all that we who live should no longer live for ourselves, but for the one who died for us and was raised. Again. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. O Lord our God, govern the nations on earth and direct the affairs of this world so that your church may worship you in peace and joy. We pray through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And Lord God, please help us always to think about the great love that you have shown us in giving us Jesus to be our Savior and, and in sending the Holy Spirit to us so that we're made your believing children and heirs of eternal life in heaven. When we think of all you've done for us, it just motivates us to live as your believing children, to strive to follow your will, to be your witnesses into all the world. Please keep on showering us with your love through your word so that that love keeps motivating us, moving us to live as your children and to share the wonderful message with which we've been blessed. That message that Christ lived, died, rose for us so that we can look forward to eternal life in heaven with him. Lord God, we keep in our prayers all those in our prayer list dealing with different trials and troubles, aches and pains. If it's your will, grant healing but grant especially just more and more of that knowledge of your grace and mercy and love, that grace and mercy and love that motivates us to appreciate all you've done for us and to live as your believing children. Your love for us, so amazing. Help us always to see that great and amazing love we pray this in Jesus' name and in his name. We gather up all of the prayers we have today as we join in praying. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Let's join in singing our prayer for our country. 
God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home sweet home. God bless America, my home sweet home. And again, I'd say thank you for joining me for worship today. Just a couple quick announcements to share with you. Yesterday, Saturday, was Diane and Ron Kennedy's 50th wedding anniversary. Today, Sunday, is Kevin Spitzley's birthday. Tuesday, my birthday. Thursday, Gary and Jeannie Kunkel have an anniversary. Friday, Nancy McCullough has a birthday. In our prayers, well, please do keep Paula with her continued leg issues, Roberta Waldron with uh, all the stroke and breathing issues that she's had, uh, Linda Hazy, Parkinson's, and well, Diane Kennedy, she told me when I saw her this week that, uh, well, she's dealing with complications from stroke, Parkinsonism, back issues, and the doctor basically said that Therapy won't help her to get better, but hopefully will help her to stay at least at the level where she is right now. Well, please do keep all these people in our, your prayers and everyone else in our prayer list. And, and remember, well, God does have more power than the doctors, so who knows what, what God can end up doing. Again, I say thank you for joining me for worship today. The Lord bless and keep you always. Amen.